Uh, good morning, Booker Tov. It's nice to uh, welcome everyone here this morning. And uh, there was a suggestion that maybe we should change the topic to uh, Noah today. It's reflective of this weather that we've been having. In any case, it's uh, wonderful that you're here and uh, interested in this uh, continuing uh, program of ours, the Lil Fader Interfaith Scholar in Residence Project, which is now in its sixth year. The, the program, uh, as the name would suggest, has been generously funded by Lil Fader, who is a tireless advocate of interfaith work and participated in many uh, Christian Jewish programs in particular for, for decades in our community. And this is really a, a wonderful tribute to her involvement and her commitment. The goal of our program is to increase religious literacy. And that's based upon the notion that underlying a lot of the prejudice and stereotypes and misunderstandings that exist between uh, various religious groups and in the public in general is the lack of education, the lack of understanding about other religious beliefs. Too often we, we hear someone snip something out of a tradition or a, a text and use that as a basis to form some generalization about a group of people or a religious tradition. And that's highly unfair because all of our sacred texts are prone to be problematic in that way. So this program really has been designed to uh, go be beneath the surface and to allow us to understand in greater depth the major religious traditions uh, in the world and thereby to expand our ability to engage in interfaith relationships and to build relationships with those communities. And we've done that, I think, pretty successfully over the past six years. So today, in our pursuit of knowledge, uh, we've been blessed to have uh, another very wise, learned, and um, uh, uh, wonderful uh, role model of an individual who lives out his uh, religious tradition in the best sense. Uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Michael Duggan, who's been part of the Beth Sedek family with Christy, uh, regular attenders of the film festival and other uh, events here. So they're, they're part of our extended family, and we always enjoy having them here. Uh, Michael's also a cherished colleague, friend, and uh, partner in a lot of interfaith work here in Calgary. Dr. Duggan is a native Calgarian, recently retired from St. Mary's University, where he was professor of religious studies and theology for over 20 years. Uh, he holds degrees in theology and sacred scripture from Jesuit universities in Rome and a PhD in biblical studies from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. His biblical research focuses on early Judaism and Christian origins. Um, he's been a visiting scholar at Cambridge, uh, involved in many um, learned societies and serves on editorial boards, uh, a very accomplished, very distinguished professor, and um, I would add just personally a wonderful mensch uh, from which to learn from. So, uh, Michael, it's a pleasure to uh, have you uh, help us conclude this year with, a, with another wonderful lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you for your kind words, Shaul, <clears throat> and for the hospitality of Beth Zedek, uh, congregation. It's always a great <clears throat> joy for Christy and me to be able to um, join the congregation. Uh, we do feel at home here. It's a spiritual home for us and a, a spiritual reference point. Um, and uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. Um, I got into my uh, interest in uh, Jewish studies uh, when I was going to high school, to St. Mary's Boys High School uh, down on 18th Avenue. It was across from the Shari Tzedek Synagogue. And my father, who worked at the stockyards, would drop me off there some mornings, and I would see uh, men going in to pray uh, in the, at the synagogue as I was going to class. And I thought, no, there is the way <clears throat> to begin your day. And I remember when I was a, a student, I, I would look at the inscription at the 
uh, top of the synagogue. It was in concrete. And I thought, I'd like to be able to read that language sometime. So that was how I began. <clears throat> but it was because of an appreciation for the distinctiveness of Judaism and the great contribution uh, that it has made to Calgary and uh, to the world at large. And that's what we are talking about. Uh, because anyone who is a Christian needs to realize our complete indebtedness to Judaism. Complete indebtedness, not partial, complete. So uh, we cannot understand our own origins unless we attend synagogue. That's quite a blunt statement, but I'll stand by it for now, at least from my experience. The other thing I would like to mention as part of what we do, and uh, inspired by uh, Bethsaidic Congregation, the leadership of Rabbi Osaji, is uh, recognize that in order to be religious today, we have to be interreligious. All of us recognize from our own background, particularly as we age, the limitations of our traditions. I can only speak about mine. But uh, we need to be engaged with uh, the traditions of East and West, First Nations traditions, uh, atheism, which is also a tradition that we need, we need to appreciate as being venerable. We need to in, be engaged with all of the traditions so that we have perspective on our own. And we can see from others both the manner in which they appreciate our tradition, as uh, Rabbi Osaji generously mentioned, toward Christianity, but also the ways that we uh, need to expand upon uh, our own growth. If I may say so, uh, uh, Jack Nearing is here. Uh, he's a dear friend who has spent uh, three months or more in Asia visiting Watts. And Jack was the superintendent of Catholic schools in Calgary. So I'll leave it to you to uh, visit with Jack to be able to see what uh, the encounter with East and West uh, has done for him and his family. The last thing I'd like to mention in, in view of what we're going to do today is I'll give you a, a resume of what we've done up until now in the previous three, three gatherings. And you'll see that the slides are very imperfect because I put them together in haste because this is the fourth gathering that we uh, are having. But our objective today is going to uh, be uh, to look at this fourth part in the three-part presentation. You can see the fellow who did the slides is not very up to date. But this fourth part uh, on Judaism, Christianity, and the shaping of religion in the 21st century uh, is a big, big topic. So the first half of what we will do today is to uh, look at the dialogue uh, between uh, Christians and Jews, particularly in view of my own tradition of Roman Catholicism. Uh, and then what we'll do is look forward to how uh, religions will be reshaped, let's say, in the next 30 years. And what are the forces that are reshaping them? You can think of your own, the ones that I will mention, if, insofar as we will have time, uh, will be the impact of science, uh, the impact of uh, the, um, certainly of feminism, which is transforming how we understand our history, how we read sacred texts, and uh, what is essential for the survival of uh, the human race, uh, because all of our sacred literature comes from only one side of the human consciousness, which is the masculine side. And so what we can be very grateful for is the courage of people who have uh, uh, brought the feminist movement to where it is so that it transforms the thinking of a person like me and perhaps others. Uh, the other thing that uh, I'll bring to mind is the concern for planetary survival and the connection uh, that we are coming to be much more sensitized to that we have to the planet as an organism and to all sentient beings. 
And that is very central. The last one that will change religion is migration and uh, the pursuit of social justice because what is happening to all of our communities, and Rabbi Osaji and Beth Sedek are at the center of this in Calgary, is that the whole world has come to Calgary. The whole world has come to all kinds of cities across the planet. We can no longer be sectarian. We need to learn how to engage and help one another. That will change religion. So with this big topic, and as we begin today, what I would ask you to think about is uh, what does it mean to be well today as the human race and as the planet? What is wellness? What does it consist of? Because we are coming to understand this with uh, wonderful developments in uh, science, in the humanities, in music, in the arts, and, and in religion uh, is part of this. We are learning about wellness. And that is changing the language of religion. It's changing our consciousness. So we'll begin now by looking at what we've done from uh, the first lecture, for those of you who were not able to be at the first one, and we'll just develop this uh, very uh, simply. When we started in the first uh, gathering, um, we uh, focused on what kind of a Jew was Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, you can go to the website and be able to see the slides from that uh, lecture. But one thing that we uh, can recognize from the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus was the eldest of a family of at least seven children. Uh, I wish somebody would write the story on the family of Jesus in Nazareth. Because in this text uh, from the Gospel of Mark, there's no mention of his father. There is mention of four brothers and the plural sisters. He's the oldest of them. We know that he was a uh, a tradesperson who probably worked on the construction of Sepphoris, a village that, or a city that the uh, Romans were building uh, north of uh, Nazareth. Now, uh, what you see is he was a, a, a prophetic figure, uh, marginal in terms of social status, uh, who was not trusted even by people in his own clan. That's what it says when uh, they were amazed, he was amazed at their unbelief. He did not uh, make sense to his kinsfolk and actually uh, to some of his brothers. James, the brother of Jesus, uh, the, uh, it says in the Gospel of John, James, the brother of Jesus, by the way, uh, managed the community in Jerusalem, but the Gospel of John says in chapter 7, verse 5, his brothers didn't believe in him. Now, there was a change that happened with that brother, James, and, pro and pro you can presume the rest. Now, as we look at this, uh, we studied the various traditions uh, about Jesus, but they coalesce on the fact that he was an observant Jew. Uh, he uh, certainly uh, observed the great festivals uh, the pilgrimage festivals of uh, Passover, Shavuot, which we uh, Christians call Pentecost, uh, as well as the festival of booths or tab tabernacles. Uh, and that uh, he had this odd uh, reality that he did not marry. He was like the prophet Jeremiah. The reason that he didn't marry was he thought the end of the world was going to happen very soon. Jeremiah didn't marry because he realized that Jerusalem would be destroyed very soon. So he became a follower of John the Baptist, who probably had been a member of the Essene community at the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls are from. And John the Baptist, again, was a person who was a prophet who defied the temple authorities in Jerusalem, as the people at the Dead Sea did. Uh, and Jesus had conflict with the temple authorities. And he became a follower of John. He did not uh, uh, stay with that. He, he started to move in uh, marginal situations and towns and villages. What I mean by marginal situations is when you hear about his healings, uh, you see that he is with people 
uh, who uh, have uh, serious physical, mental illness, uh, people who are very impoverished, people who um, are um, without the means of being able to provide for themselves. And so what you see, there were rabbis who were doing this. He isn't the only person. But what I want you to see is this is the mix of what he learned from Judaism is you care for people and you care for people who have no human rights. That's, that's what made him a Jew. That was his interpretation of Torah. He's not the only one. I want you to, to see this very, very carefully because what we're going to see is unfortunately when Christianity loses contact with its Jewish roots, it plays off the Jesus tradition against Jewish tradition. This makes no sense in the origins. So we have five primary traditions in uh, what we call New Testament literature, which I think is better classified, at least up until the uh, until 70, all of these traditions should have been part of what we call Hellenistic Judaism. The texts are written in Greek, therefore uh, audiences outside of Israel. And the basis of those audiences uh, are, are people who were uh, Jews in the synagogue as well as Gentiles who were attending synagogue. When you look at the five major traditions, of Jesus, Peter, James, Paul, John. What is common to all of them is each of those person, uh, people uh, is uh, a practicing Jew uh, in, uh, um, and is rooted in Pharisaic tradition. Now, uh, as we studied those traditions, and you, what I want you to see is there is a diversity of Christianities in the New Testament. Christianity is not one singular movement, different uh, communities, depending on where they were formed in the uh, Hellenistic world or in Israel, had different ways of celebrating the Jesus tradition. All of them came back to the celebration of Passover, which became the basis for uh, the uh, Christians gathering in their homes to celebrate the uh, Last Supper of Jesus. Now, we went on to talk about developments in the first and second century. Uh, and uh, we talked about the anti-Judaism that there is, and particularly in some texts in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of John. Those texts came from after the temple was destroyed in 70. They were added on to the tradition uh, because of polemics within Judaism, tensions within Judaism. But those, those texts that we read as anti-Jewish were actually part of very intense debates between people who acknowledged each other as Jews. And after the temple was destroyed, the uh, 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 Pharisaic tradition of the rabbis felt that they had to get rid of sectarian movements because they no longer had the temple as the meeting point and the point of unity for all Jews. And therefore, the Torah had to be the meeting point. And they uh, identified the 24 scrolls of Torah around the year 100 in a conference at uh, Yavne or Jamnia on the uh, coast of Israel. And they said, people who are going beyond this and beyond what we see as the traditions of the rabbis that got uh, uh, written into the Mishnah, uh, the Tosefta, and later on in the Talmud, we have to let them go for now. We've got enough problems to relocate our point of unity, we're going to do that in the sacred text. So where we came to after this was uh, a uh, focus in our second uh, uh, session, which was on the, the origins of the imperial Christianity. How did this movement, and I'd like you to think about this, when we read of Jesus of Nazareth, he is executed by the Roman emperor by the uh, uh, agent of the, or the uh, official who works for the Roman Empire, which is Pontius Pilate, and uh, Roman soldiers. He's executed by them in Jerusalem. There's a small group of people at the temple who want to see him disappear. But that's, that's a small group. I want to emphasize that. And it's part of the tradition that you would have of tensions between the temple and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea community. 
Uh, and so, how did this person who was executed by the Roman Empire become the embodiment of the power of the Roman Empire from the fourth century onward? If you go to the great churches, which I uh, was fortunate enough to frequent when I was a student in Rome, but if you go to uh, St. Mary Major's Church, or you go to St. Peter's, you go to St. John Lateran, uh, what do you see? Or St. Paul's outside the walls, what do you see? You see iconography of Jesus presented in the image of Alexander the Great. This is not the person who is with marginal Jews who are practicing their tradition without any resources in a world where 90% of people are utterly, utterly destitute. Now he becomes the embodiment of power. And the confessions of faith relate to that ideology of power. Now, I don't want to just be provocative, uh, but I do want you to think that all of the formulations of the uh, councils of the church from the fourth century onward were done at councils that were called by the emperor. What's, what was the emperor trying to do in the fourth and fifth century from Constantine onward? is find a religious tradition that would unite the diverse people in what we would call the Mediterranean world and beyond, going north to Gaul and elsewhere. But ideology becomes very strong. And when you read those formulations, I, I will make a provocative statement. Jesus of Nazareth, who spoke Aramaic, could not have understood them. Because you have to know Greek. And you have to know Greek metaphysics as it came through the tradition of Plato and Aristotle. These are brilliant formulations. But what I'd like you to think about then is that the culture of the Roman Empire is the culture of, uh, a, a, is from Latin tradition and Greek tradition. What starts to be missing is the tradition that is in Aramaic and Hebrew. Now, it's not missing everywhere, because if you look at the Christianity in Syria, Iraq, Chaldean Christianity, Ethiopic Christianity, Egyptian Christianity, that maintains a Semitic tenor. And you want to be aware of the great diversity there is in Christianity. But one of the things that is very important for us to think about that's part of the interreligious dialogue we have today is mentalities. We don't see them explicitly, but those of us who come from a Christian tradition are shaped by the mentalities of, uh, that derive from Greek, uh, Greece and Rome. We are not shaped, if we're in Western Christianity, we don't have access as we're growing up to the uh, Semitic tradition of Hebrew and Aramaic. And there is a great lecture, by the way, by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs on the internet, uh, where he talks about this, that we are now at a point where we are bringing the traditions of Greece and Rome that became dominant in Western Christianity into dialogue with uh, Semitic traditions of Aramaic, Hebrew, which are in Judaism, and now we are starting to become more well because we're becoming multicultural and we're thinking in different language uh, uh, forms and we're getting out of our boxes. And what this is in the Second Vatican Council, that is called ressourcement. It's a French term meaning return to the sources and what's the return to the sources? When a person starts to read the New Testament in, if I could call it that, or Second Testament, the literature of earliest Christianity, uh, what, you, what you realize when you read it is the words resonate with Aramaic. They resonate with 
Hebrew text of the Hebrew Bible. Now that is a very important thing because what the Vatican Council then did was to say, you have got to go back to Jewish origins. And by the way, we'll see some statements that say, the best way of doing that is attend synagogue and study the Bible with Jews. It's very interesting. But the last thing I want to mention about this is religious traditions always change. They're fluid. They're not static. They change. And the art of the change comes from the art of being well. That's what I'd like you to think about. And with what I have said about feminism, that art of being well is embodied in mothers who raise their children. The reason I mention that is because their um, voice is not in sacred text for the most part. Now, I know I've given you a lot, but that's going to get us now to aesthetics synagogue and the congregation. And what we're going to look at is the dialogue. OK, so just take a breather. If you feel like getting up and getting a, co a coffee after what I've just done, getting something to eat, having a sleep, feel free to do so. This is a very appropriate uh, response. But the, the key for what we're going to do now is catch your breath and relax. And say, I only want to take in what is helpful for me. And what I want to find as helpful for me is what connects me to my own personal convictions and to my family. That's what I want you to focus on. Don't focus on theory that I am going to give you. I want you to focus on how you feel about words you're going to see now. Okay, I'm going to keep an eye on the time so that we can, okay, welcome home, at least to, for those who are in the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, of course, at uh, St. Peter's, we, the reason I put that up is because the Vatican Council took place there from <clears throat> October of uh, 1962, actually December 8th of no, October 20th of 1962 until uh, December 8th of 1965. It changed Roman Catholicism. Central to the change that it brought to Roman Catholicism, and I want to highlight this very sincerely, is the document. It's got a very poor title. It's the Declaration on Non-Christian Religions. Think of non-Christian as being very patronizing as if the distinction is between Christian and non-Christian. Actually, people today in Rome would call it the declaration on uh, how we become interreligious. So, but the key to this is paragraph four. And this was the subject of great debate. You could see that it was published at the very end of the council after three years of deliberation. And paragraph four is on uh, Judaism. Now, with this, it's not just Judaism as, uh, how could I say it, I, 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 thinking in theological terms. This was Roman Catholicism and people at the council from other churches beginning to come to terms with the Shoah. And what I'd like you to recognize uh, here at Beth Zedek is what instructed the Second Vatican Council in a very profound way was the experience of Jews uh, in uh, the extermination of European Jews through the Second World War with the complicity of Christian churches particularly Roman Catholicism. Now that's a lot, but I want you not just to think of the theory, I want you to think of the experience. The awakening of people who are very devout to saying, we have done great harm. That doesn't mean uh, active alone active participation in uh, the Nazi regime and what it perpetrated. But it was the beginning of looking back uh, at statements and ways of phrasing uh, 
documents, writing articles that comprised 16 centuries of anti-Judaism. It's not light. It's going to be, begin to be addressed in one paragraph. Now, what you could see is this, this is ongoing. And the way to get at this is by experience and feeling and not just by theory. You'll see that these are halting steps. So, the beginning that I would like you to uh, be aware of, and I'll, bring, I'll put up the, uh, uh, the reference that they're quoting. This is a quotation uh, of Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, Paul is a very controversial figure uh, for all Jews. But what, it, what you, we, uh, we asked in the first, question, uh, first lecture is, did he intend to start something different from Judaism. I want to propose that he didn't. He was trying to reform it by bringing Gentiles into uh, the tradition. Where he fell afoul was that he, he said for Gentiles, <clears throat> there's only minimal observance that they have to keep because the whole of the Torah is summarized in you will love your neighbor as yourself. Now, there's lots of rabbis that would summarize the Torah in the same way. But the way Paul practiced it caused a lot of controversy, not just with the synagogues, but also with a person like James, the brother of Jesus, who was managing the community in Jerusalem. They never reconciled with Paul during his lifetime. But notice what Paul says here is there are seven attributes that he wants to insist the community uh, in Rome recognize uh, as he is writing there around the year 58 of the Common Era. Theirs is the sonship or adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law or the Torah, the worship, the promises. Theirs are the fathers or the patriarchs and matriarchs, and from them is the Messiah according to the flesh. If you look at them, there are seven attributes. What he goes on to say, that's in Romans chapter, chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. What he goes on to say in Romans 9 to 11 is this. For heaven's sake, don't cut yourself off from the root of Judaism because you are a wild olive branch that has been grafted onto that root in a very surprising way. But you will not be able to survive if you separate yourself from that root. That's why Romans 9 to 11 is very, very significant. Now, that's what they pick up on. There's the reference there. And notice what this is, is resource among. This is going back to read the sacred text in its original context and setting. I can't describe this in a short way, but before, before the Second Vatican Council, people would read a text like this, but only in Latin translation. In Latin translation, you don't get the resonances that say, but what does this mean in Greek to people from Jewish traditions, Gentile traditions in Rome in 58? You're stopping us at the 5th century. You're not allowing us to get back. This is the, what happens. The next thing that you want to see at the end of chapters 9 to 11 that the council document refers to is Paul's statement in Romans 11:29 which is the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. What he means by that is Judaism is always the foundation and the source. Do not think that because in, in the Christian tradition we uh, recognize Jesus as Messiah, that God therefore has withdrawn his call from Jews and has withdrawn the gifts that he endowed the human race through Judaism. Do you see what's happening? As Paul is saying, don't, don't, don't abandon these roots. Now, these are the two texts that for the next 50 years, uh, Roman Catholicism will return to in Jewish-Christian dialogue. If you sit with them and you reflect on them, you'll be able to understand. 
Now, again, at the Second Vatican Council, you have uh, this statement uh, in the uh, uh, same document, Nostra Aetate, which means in our era, uh, in her rejection of every persecution against any person, the Church, mindful of the patrimony she shares with Jews and moved not by political reasons but by the Gospel's spiritual love, decries hatred, persecution, displays of anti-Semitism, directed against Jews at any time and by anyone. That is a statement from 1965. If you go to a Christian church, yeah, how often have you heard that quoted? I think we would all say not often enough. But it's, it is 54 years old. Now, the next thing, we move to what we are doing here. Again, from 54 years ago, since the spiritual patrimony common to Christians and Jews is so great, this synod, the Vatican Council, the 20th uh, of all the church councils, wants to uh, foster and recommend mutual understanding and respect, <clears throat> uh, which is above all uh, of uh, the theological studies and dialogue, which is what we're doing today. It's an abstract way of saying, get together and talk. Okay. Now, they, at the, uh, at the, uh, in 1965, they had to make a very strong statement about reading uh, the Gospel text, particularly of the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Matthew. That originated, by the way, in, in, in these uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, um, groups that were quite apocalyptic, uh, that became came to be called Christianity. The Jews cannot be charged with the execution of Jesus, and the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God. The reason that they put this statement in is because, this is very difficult for me to say, but I want you to hear it very strongly, that on Good Friday there was a in the Latin liturgy before the council, there was prayer for the perfidious Jews that they would be converted. This is rejecting that. Now, when you see this, what I'd like you to see is the importance of critical thinking in any tradition that we are in. And ask yourself, what does it mean to be orthodox? In these traditions, if I may say so, what it means to be orthodox is to practice love of everyone. It cannot be formulated in statements, ideological statements, unless those ideological statements are inspiring everyone to love. This is, only, this is the beginning. Now, I'm going to take you very quickly through a couple of um, uh, more documents, just so you see the tradition growing. And then we're going to bring it back to ourselves. In 1998, uh, during the uh, papacy of John Paul II. Uh, this was a document that the Roman Catholic Church uh, published on We Remember, a Reflection on the Shoah. Uh, this is a recognition of uh, John Paul's visit to Yad Vashem uh, uh, at that time in uh, Jerusalem. And what, you, what I want you to just take a look at is this line here at the bottom. I, I mentioned these documents in case you would like to go and see them. We deeply regret the errors and failures of those sons and daughters of the church who did not defend Jews during the Second World War in Europe. The reason I mention this statement is because it is the focus of a lot of discussion because what uh, Jews would say is, but why can't you say we regret the errors and the failures of how we have run our church for 1,600 years. Insofar as this has created an environment in Europe that was so anti-Semitic in many of its expressions, not just at the Second World War, but before that. And so this is part of the drama, if you're a Roman Catholic, in my tradition, the drama is, can we say that we were wrong? And if we read the biblical tradition, 
the biblical tradition of the Torah and the prophets is all based on this, I think I'd say this, Paul's encounter with the risen Christ who was Jesus in the communities he was persecuting. What, what, what was the word that he heard? It's the same word that the prophets heard. It's the same word that Moses heard in uh, Exodus 3. I don't want to uh, I don't want to offend you by saying what I think of it because you might say I disagree that Paul would say this, but what did Paul hear? It's this, you are wrong. You are wrong. What's leading you to harm people, that's wrong. What did Moses hear uh, in the Sinai wilderness when he was called? You're wrong just to be staying here. You have to free people from slavery. I'll work with you, and that's what we will do. But it begins by saying you are wrong. And that's liberating. And that's still what this large universal church is struggling to come to terms with on an institutional basis. If you listen to Pope Francis, if I can interject that, when he gave an interview uh, in uh, Buenos Aires before he became Pope, what was quite compelling was they said to him, because he never said things, uh, he was very quiet in view of the dirty war there. I said, who, who is Jorge Bergoglio? He said, I want you to know he's a sinner. And my experience is that as I look back at decisions I've made in my life, I am so overwhelmed that I can appreciate why people in the same situation would say, I can no longer continue to go on. He said, mercifully, I found the resources to go on. But he said, that's who I am. If you want, if you want, if you want to know. Do you see what he's, what he, he's, he's basing, what, what, what he's basing his point on is that. That point, we, it's only when we see failure that we can begin anew. Okay. Okay, look at the first sentence. The tragedy of the Jewish people would lead to a new relationship with the Jewish people. It's very important for us to, you know, from the tradition that I come from, for us to say it's not enough to be against anti-Semitism. Anti what we have to do is, is join the family. We've got to heal the family. Okay, we wish to turn awareness of past sins to a resolve to build a new future. This is, this is uh, the tradition of the Hebrew scripture, particularly in the post-exilic age, early Judaism. Then we come to this statement, which is very lamentably, very important for today in the world that we're into today, the spoiled seeds of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism must never again be allowed to take root in any human heart. Think of what is happening today. Think of what is happening in the nativism today, what is happening in Europe, what's happening everywhere. All of us need to address this inside of ourselves. It's the key to, major key, if we're going to deal with racism, if we're going to deal with ethnic profiling, and the, the great service of the, for instance, the <coughs> Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., is that any time you go there, they will have displays of genocides that have taken place in the 20, 20th and now the 21st century to say, as you look at our experience and how we have documented, please see that this is, the, the, uh, this is connected with what many people are going through. Everyone is different, but it's that solidarity in awakening people to what is happening that has been part of the great patrimony 
uh, of uh, Jews uh, after the Second World War to awaken us. We, we need to change. We need to learn. And we need to learn from people who have been through this. Now, the last one that I'll mention is this very interesting document in 2015, <clears throat> when Pope Fran after Pope Francis became uh, the head of the Catholic Church. And it, notice it goes back to that text in Romans. The gifts and the callings of God, calling of God are irrevocable. So they develop language. The Jews are our elder brothers uh, uh, in the faith, fathers in the faith. Now, every one of us will stand up and say, this is gender-exclusive language. When are these people going to get a life and talk about <coughs> our uh, ancestors in the faith, our mothers in the faith? What they, but you can see what it is, what the indication is, is that Judaism... The faith of Abraham is the norm for all Christianity. You want to recognize Christianity says that it, is a, it founds itself on being an expression of the uh, relationship between Abraham and God. So, when describing dialogue between Jews and Christians, it is saying this is different than dialogue with any other religious tradition. Because why? For Christians, it is returning home. It's being the prodigal child to say, I want to come home and I want to meet my family again. And therefore, these are not, notice what it's saying, this is not two fundamentally different religions confronting each other. This is finding common roots. Here we come back to our first class, okay, where we, where we started our series. And this kind of summarizes the first class. You could say, we've got to throw out the professor. We've got to just, you could put this in one or two sentences. Why couldn't he put it in one or two sentences? But it's this. The soil that nurtured both Jews and Christians is the Judaism of Jesus' time. We could stop there and say, now I got it. Now I got it. It not only brought forth Christianity, but after the destruction of the temple in the year 70, the post-biblical rabbinical Judaism, which then had to do without the sacrificial uh, forms of worship at the temple, and in its further development had to uh, depend on prayer and the interpretation of both oral and uh, written and oral divine revelation. The written Torah, the oral Torah in the Talmud and Jews and Christians have the same mother, which would be the tradition of Abraham, and <clears throat> uh, can be seen as two siblings who have developed in different directions. What this sets up is, would Christians then want to convert Jews to Christianity? The answer is no. That's my answer. You read the document further, they fudge on it. But they're getting there. They're getting there, okay? There are two ways that God can make the scriptures of Israel their own. Very important. The scriptures which the Christians call Old Testament is therefore open to both ways. It's better for the Christians to call it Hebrew scripture. But what I'd like us, what I'd like us now to, to recognize is the primacy here of Christians being able to learn uh, the Torah, the prophets, the writings, the Tanakh, uh, within synagogues to find their roots. Okay? Now, notice, goes on to make this statement that the uh, covenant is not uh, irrevocable. So here's the big question. If Christians say that we are the people of God, then the question is, but then who are the Jews? Who are the Jews? And that's a big, big theological question because the Jews are the people of God. In the rabbis, there is a big question in medieval rabbis. <clears throat> they say it this way. How is it? 
what happened to our scripture? How is it that these people, whoever they are, they are saying the people of God are people who actually hate us Jews? How did they get there? That's what we have to work on now. The covenant that God concluded with Israel has never been revoked and remains valid on the basis of God's unfailing love. So, what we now have to do, which is what we're going to try to do in the second half of the class today, which is how do we move forward? Well, we move forward through joint engagement throughout the world to work for justice, peace, the conservation of creation, and reconciliation. This is what Rabbi Osachi is doing today, if I may say so, in the amazing, astonishing work that he is doing with the Muslim communities in Calgary. It's, it's astonishing that they welcome a rabbi to come and teach them how not to hate. That's that it should be very, very, very proud that that's what it is doing for the community in Calgary. Today, religion should not be part of the problem. They need to be part of the solution. You think about solutions. They can only be part of the solution if they change. It doesn't mean you throw away everything. But you change by saying, what am I learning today as I am raising my children? As I am raising my, uh, being with my child, my, uh, my uh, uh, niece, my nephew, who self-identifies as LGBTQ and beyond, teaching me, who is marrying people from different cultures in the world, teaching me, there we go. So we have to, what is successful dialogue? among religions. What does it produce? It produces love and it produces world peace. It's not just thinking. It's being changed at the order of being so that we become connected with people that formerly we thought we could never be connected to. One of the things my students would teach me is you can tell how healthy a person is if you look at the spectrum of people who they call their friends the cultures, the uh, languages, the intuitions. And that is happening today across the world in an unprecedented fashion. That's the work of faith is to engage in that. And again, we come to a point in the document uh, from Rome that Always, we are together in engaging uh, in combating manifestations of racial discrimination against Jews and all forms of anti-Semitism. And then you go on to issues of prejudice. History teaches us where even the slightest perceptible forms of anti-Semitism can lead. You can read the rest of this, but you know it very well. People in the community that issued this document feel particularly obliged to do all that is possible to uh, uh, repel anti-Semitic tendencies, to identify them and call them out. Okay, we're going to pause here. I'm going to ask you to stand up, take a breath, and uh, maybe what we should do is have a little co has kind of conversation now and then we'll see how far we'll get with the changing of religion, but it could come up with our conversation. So why don't you take a break, and then we will get back together, okay? Great. Now, uh, what we can do now is maybe if you could uh, just give me some feedback on what you have heard. Uh, please make your comments or questions very short so that uh, everyone has a chance to uh, think about them. And 
I leave this up because this is where we're going next. And if in the conversation there's opportunities for us to, or you would like to speak to, uh, ask questions about some of these issues, feel free to do so. Uh, I would like to show you my uh, slides after this because they're all pictures. They're not, uh, they're not just words, and that would be a relief to everyone. Okay, uh, could we begin? Yes, Rabbi. Uh, Michael, so I was thinking, had the Holocaust not happened, what would it have taken Christianity to evolve to these far-sighted and profound conclusions? I hope we will all think about that, because I don't have the answer. If the Holocaust had not happened, what would uh, have provoked Christianity to think about these issues? And I really can't answer it. But the one thing I, I would like to mention is that this is the beginning of emotional intelligence in the Catholic Church. And it's because of confronting suffering in which it has been implicated. And uh, the reason that I say emotional intelligence is because the, there's a document at the Second Vatican Council called the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. It's the first time there was in the 20 uh, uh, ecumenical councils, universal councils of the Church, that they spoke about emotions. It's the first time they talked about uh, being pastoral. Care, here's how you care for people. Rather than saying, here's what you believe, here's, here's, here's how we connect with each other. And here's the statement. It's the first uh, paragraph of uh, this pastoral constitution, which is that the joys and hopes, the fears and uh, suffering of the human uh, of humankind are the joys and hopes and the fears and the sufferings of Christians. So what makes us connect with one another is the shared experience of life falling apart. We all know if we sit down with a friend and the friend says, I want to explain to you what a genius I am or how my ideas are better than yours. Would you like to continue drinking coffee with that person? No, we'd all walk away and say, no, I, I, I got that all right. But if a person, if you say, how are you? And a person says, I'm really struggling. And you say, would you like to talk about it? Like to, would you like to uh, have a coffee? And when you're saying this, here's what I'm going through myself. This is why I think nurses should run the world, by the way. But it's that point. And that is what uh, the Shoah did to awaken uh, Roman Catholicism. And that's why, um, as a consequence, a person like Pope Francis with his own history, I'm not, he's got lots of limitations. He'd be the first to say that. But that's why he would say, Ideologies divide, but it's shared experience that unites. And when he talks to the cardinals at the Vatican, he'll say, look, what I'd like you to do is sit down with one person and listen to them. And what will happen as you listen to them is all of your certainties will fall apart. Because each person has within themselves a uniqueness and a unique experience that defies the categories that we use to establish our certainties. And that's what has happened. Anybody out? Now, please, when you hear this, please see where we're going with feminism, and please see where we're going with mindfulness and emotional intelligence. Those are the keys, I think, for us to consider in terms of the development of interfaith understanding, cross-cultural understanding, and bringing peace to the world, and to dropping, our, uh, dropping the national borders, making them penetrable anyway. Anybody else? Please. Just out of curiosity, with Christianity being the largest uh, religious in the world, we have to 
take a look at the oxymorons that that uh, are the behavior of the church, especially not necessarily limited to the Catholic Church. How can people reconcile what God is asking us to do, including Christians, and and the oxymoronic ideology that exists? So how, how do you reconcile that? How do you trust that? Well... I mean, they're great words. No, but it, it, and, and your point is, is, is absolutely essential. And all of us need to think about this or, or contemplate it. The one way of looking at it in terms of this tradition is that the term faith, and this is why we have to go back to Hebrew scripture, the term faith, uh, emet in Hebrew, term that we translate as faith, is relational. So it says, Abraham trusted Adonai, and it was counted to Abraham as righteousness. What is trust? It's having within oneself the confidence that reality is reliable. It's not reducible to what you believe. It is that you, are, you got out of bed this morning, in spite of what you have to face. That's what Hebrew scripture calls faith. Second Vatican Council will talk about that. But if you get to the ideology, what you believe, and the great gift that Judaism has is it doesn't have dogmatic formulations. It's only got one, and that is that God, Adonai is one. You will love Adonai. You will love your neighbor. So how do you trust? It's only by saying, you have to demonstrate that you are trustworthy. It's, 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 it's okay for me to say I can't trust that. But then work through it. What will make the environment trustworthy? That's the, that's the key to, uh, for instance, with any congregation. Is, is it safe for me to, to come here? In Christian churches, the key to Caring in a Christian church is to ask the question, who's not here and why are they not here? The reason they're not there is because it's not trustworthy. What is the ideology of the church? Okay, it was exemplative, exemplative of behavior. If we, including us, if we saw in each other, God in us, would that not provide confidence in the fact that when you say we're thinking about all the things that are bad, we feel bad about what happened in the Holocaust, we feel bad about this. And yet, what are the changes? There's things going on today. You don't care for the churches. Why? Well, you're absolutely right. You're, what can I say? Is that we're, um, we're dealing with a situation, in this case, of religion being fossilized in fear. What would happen if somebody says you are wrong and you only feel ashamed, you withdraw? So one of the elements that we want to see, for instance, in the Hebrew scripture, is the opposite of trusting Adonai is not just not trusting, it's being afraid, it's being insecure. And the demonstration of security is in a parent is when their child is able to say, can I tell you why I think you're crazy? And you sit down and say, yes, please do, because I love you. That's what we need to come to. And that's what many people are doing. People who are here are people who are being self-critical. But it's at that level of learning what are the forces within us that trap us in sectarianism and cause us to say, but I have to be perfect. I have to be absolutely right. And I have to present my per myself as absolutely right. 
underneath that is terrible insecurity, isn't it? It's the security, the insecurity that comes from the fear of loss. And so what we're, we're seeing today in institutional religions, in, including, I think, in Roman Catholicism, is the need, uh, is the challenge of being able to say, it's okay for to learn and to grow. Actually, you have to. In order to grow, you have to learn by listening to words that cause you to see the shadows. And once you see the shadows of your life, then you can become wise because you, have, you, you can change your instincts. I could go on about this, but I, what I'm trying to say is basically what you are implying, which is, it, it, in, remember at the beginning, I said we have to focus on wellness. And wellness is an experience of being. It is not thinking about wellness. <laughs> it is the experience of wellness. It's very intuitive. It's not mental. It's very intuitive. That's what's happening in religious traditions. Now, one tradition that I'm familiar with that starts with this is Buddhism. What is the first tenet of Buddhism? And that is that life is suffering. And therefore, we want to make uh, communities safe for people to come and say, here's my affliction. And what's the source of suffering? It's not someone else. The source of suffering is my attachment. My attachment to who I think I am. My attachment to who I think I want to be. My attachment to my reputation, whatever it might be. And then it says, you, we've, we've then have to go through the transformation of how we see reality and the way that changes is by working in relationship to one another, learning to love. And that's what's, that's what's happening and has to happen in all of these religions. Yes? I'd like to ask you a question about your experiences as a university professor. And I appreciate your beliefs. And in light of that, I'd like to ask you how influential and transformative were you when you delivered your lectures to the students at the university? <laughs> well, what I'm grateful for is my students put up with me and they were very, had to practice great endurance. So whatever, whatever they left with was, <laughs> was <laughs> um, um, no, I, it's, it's more than that. It's that um, they taught me an enormous amount. Uh, all I can talk about is their influence on me. I can't talk about mine on them. Um, sometimes they would say to me, what are you? I would say, question I ask myself all the time. I don't know how to answer that. But uh, at first, it's one student said, what are you? Are you a Buddhist? Are you Jewish? Uh, my grandfather, he told me, you can't be a Buddhist and be a Christian at the same time. What are you? I said, well, I, I don't know whether you call me uh, a Buddhist, uh, Jewish, Christian, or whatever. I don't know. But the one, the one experience that we had with one another, I hope, is that students were using the class as an opportunity to, uh, to think about What brings joy in my life, and who are my friends? And generally, they would say, I can't, I can't just identify with one group. And that's, the, that's what's so hopeful. I had a, if I could say so, I, I, uh, I had one student who, in my class, and I, I, I only say this because this is a person who embodies wisdom who uh, would come with a rather scruffy beard sometimes, and, and the next time would come wearing spiked high heels, fishnet stockings, and kind of a mini dress. And what was so good was everybody in the class didn't blink. And I was grateful that I didn't blink, because this was this person. And we were talking about the Bible. 
So do you see, no matter where we are, we're learning. And that's my experience of that. Anybody else? Yes. Um, if you'll forgive the, the, the expression, uh, when you're talking to a group like this, that you're kind of preaching to the choir um, a lot of the time. And I wonder, in the interfaith dialogue, how, how does one approach dialogue with people who belong to religious groups who, for example, really believe that um, it's only when all the Jews accept their religion that world peace will happen. It's only when all the Jews convert to whatever that there will be, that the Messiah will come. And since I've been on the end, of the receiving end of this kind of proselytizing, how do you talk to people like that? How do you get those people to come to the table with one of their essential beliefs? Um, Has their own... The ex elimination of another religious group. Yes. I think everybody is a, has their own way of, of handling this. Um, I think all a person can do is listen and then say, but I don't agree. That doesn't correspond to my experience. And um, the one thing that uh, I think we gradually learn is that when we talk about Here's what my life has taught me. Another person can't dismiss that. Because it, it, it's experience that is the teacher. And so it takes, it takes patience. And it also takes time to say, maybe we can't carry on this conversation any farther. But it, it, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me, and it sounds it sounds, um, it sounds very, like whatever word we use, very divisive or demeaning. Well, people have to hear that. Uh, I, I don't think you are able to listen to me right now, so maybe we can't go on. There's, there's you know, there, there's all these strategies, but one of the things uh, that we, we need to be able to do sometimes is to say, well, maybe we, we need to stop here and let life unfold and let it teach you what it's going to teach you. But what we always need to do is to say, I disagree. Because we, the, what, what we are responsible for is to be true to what is inside of us, to be true to our experience. Our only vocation in life is to be uniquely ourselves. If we're unique to our fingerprints, the only vocation we have is to be uniquely ourselves. That's why I quote over and again to my students in my classes, I quote uh, Rabbi Osaji, who says, when you have three Jews, you have five opinions. In my tradition, that's not what you would say. But we, we have to learn. So I guess what I'm in encouraging is, please, uh, in the Jewish tradition, feel you need to be our teachers to teach by experience. Because the Shoah is teaching us by experience. You need to teach us by experience. And it's, a, it's a hard, hard process. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. what, what effect did the 1965 uh, Roman Catholic document have on, on Protestantism? On which? Protestantism. Um, um, yes. The World Council of Churches issued a similar document in 1967. Since that time, the uh, uh, major uh, Protestant traditions in Europe, right, certainly the Lutheran tradition because it was located so strongly in Germany, and I think some of the Calvinist traditions took up uh, this um, initiative. So. Martin Luther, as a monk in the church of his time, made very, very derogatory statements about Jews uh, that are part of that heritage. And so uh, the Lutheran tradition officially renounces those. But it's, it's a process. And I think what we want to 
uh, I, I, uh, in light of all of your comments uh, that um, uh, we want to recognize is this is hard work and it is emotionally taxing. And maybe if I could just interject this, we have to learn certainly uh, we, ne we need, as Christians, we need to be so grateful for Jews who will talk to us. But maybe also we need to learn from the very courageous feminists who said, could I, could I say to the world what's missing and making the world insane is nobody knows my experience. <laughs> It's not written in my text. When I go to my place of worship, I don't see this. It's very hard work. But it, one of the great things that we're having today is uh, that with the understanding of, of human identity as covering and gender and sexuality, covering great spectrums, is now we're starting to learn. Person goes to the Vatican uh, and you look at the paintings Michelangelo, Raphael, listen to the music. It comes from people who are uh, the genius of uh, being gay. The genius. So it, it's, it's a process of learning the obvious, isn't it? That's the challenge. Anybody else? Oh, please, at the back. Yes. I, um I'm curious about your feelings and juxtaposition of um, 1965, talking about the injustice of the Holocaust, and yet at the same time the religious schools are going on. At the, rela at the same time? At the same time, in 1965, was really the height of indoctrination of the religious schools here in Canada. How's the church feeling about that? I didn't get the second part. I'm sorry, my, my hearing How is the church dealing with the, the whole issue of the residential schools in, in terms, as it's being referred to now, another form of genocide, much like the Holocaust, which in 1965 was what we were talking about, and yet they were still performing another form of that in this country, and maybe in other countries too that we don't know about. But how is the church dealing with that kind of their history? Um, in various various ways of um, that, are, that I think people in the churches would many would say are absolutely inadequate. Um, Pope Francis was invited to come to Canada uh, to Saskatchewan to meet with First Nations leaders, and he he said no, he wasn't coming. Probably, if, if you want my interpretation, is he was saying. The bishops in Canada, they need to do this before I will come. I'm not here to come and intrude on somebody else's culture if it, there isn't work going on as a ground floor. So as an example, what he's doing in the Amazon rainforest is because there's people there that are engaging the issue. So I don't want to uh, make uh, uh, too many uh, comments because they'd be far too general. But what we need uh, in uh, Roman Catholicism, uh, institutions, I could say it, uh, ones that I've been connected with. We need museums of residential schools. We need people who are uh, leading tours of those museums about residential schools who are from uh, First Nations communities. We need to be taught. Uh, this is part of the issue of uh, also, if I, if I could say, uh, I have a slide farther on about a, a First Nations elder who is a woman, a lawyer. She was running to be the uh, leader of the First Nations voice in Parliament. But she says, I think the time is here <clears throat> when people will realize that the last best chance for saving the environment in Canada lies with First Nations people. Because they have the languages that relate to the ground that we live on. And they have the traditions and the intuitions that uh, are uh, derived from relating to the animals and the creatures. They get us out of this anthropocentric world. So all I can say is your question reflects uh, 
how primitive the beginnings are right now. The Anglican Church, to their uh, great credit, have uh, priests, uh, of course, women and men, and uh, who are from First Nations communities. I had uh, Margaret Waterchief. Do any of you know Margaret Waterchief? The over uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I asked her to come to uh, my class so that my students would be able to meet a priest. And Margaret Waterchief has uh, 10 children. Uh, she's from the Pagan uh, community. And uh, she did enormous uh, work uh, here in, in Calgary in uh, the outreach to people uh, in downtown who were impoverished. But when they met Margaret, they met the tradition as it is being lived out in a way that we all need to encounter in order to be healthy. Anybody else? Okay, let me, uh, do, uh, do you want to stop here? I think, actually, I think it's time to stop here. So. What's this? Take a few more minutes okay, what, I, what I'd like you to, maybe if we could do this very quickly, because it's, it's part of uh, just considering how our minds have the opportunity to change. And um, this change is hard. I, I can speak autobiographically. The change is hard. Uh, but... One thing that's going to change all of us is science and technology. Uh, you have robots, you have iPhones, uh, but maybe I should have put up Xbox there because that's capturing uh, the minds and hearts of people uh, who are young people in dialogue with people across the world and they don't sleep at night. They, uh, the technology is so dramatic and its influence is so strong on them. But we are the first generation to be able to contemplate ourselves through this picture. When I would talk to my students, I would say to them, you know, when I was in high school or university, we never had a photograph like that. We're the first people to be able to contemplate the human race as a totality, to have that sense of holistic vision. We're the first people to be able to look at that and contemplate the earth not as a commodity, a resource of commodities, but as an organism. And a beautiful statement, by the way, in Genesis, is a beautiful uh, rabbinic, uh, 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 biblical scholar, a Jewish biblical scholar, who says, if you read Genesis chapters one and two, in chapter one, what it describes is that the earth is uh, enclosed in a membrane of water. So you have the earth it's got a membrane of water around it. But that unifies the human race. Christy saw a display of that at the Air and Space Museum in Washington and had wonderful descriptions uh, when she came uh, uh, home to tell me about. It caused me to think that uh, if all of us woke up every day and saw this Earth moving through space at 119,000 kilometers an hour. We're going pretty fast. Rotating at 24,000 miles an hour around the center, or something like that. We would say, that's all we've got. There isn't another place like it. Surely we can stop the arms race. Surely we can say we can only be well together. Surely we can say we need all the languages, all the cultures, because those languages and cultures are going into extinction with the same rapidity as life forms. We're the first people to have that, and science is giving it to us. We're beginning to locate ourselves in the cosmos. That is uh, simply a galaxy, Milky Way. These are clusters of galaxies. This, these are slides from the astronomy class at St. Mary's that uh, Dr. Braverman teaches. But we're, we're not even in that picture. 
But those, are, those little dots are galaxies like the Milky Way. And in terms of time, as we look at the Earth, we realize if we put it on the span of just a year, from January 1st at midnight, and we're at December 31st at midnight, um, the dinosaurs uh, were here on December 26th, five days ago. Um, the biblical texts were given to us seven seconds ago, and uh, we're very late arrivals. We're not the center of anything. Leonid, who teaches uh, astronomy, would say the question, when I'd say, Leonid, where are we in the cosmos? He said, what are you, what are you talking about? What? He said, we're 28,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way galaxy, but you've got to think of four dimensions. But he said, the question, Michael, is this. It's not what do we know. It. It's will the human race last long enough to know anything? That, that, that would deflate our pride, wouldn't it? It'd help us to learn from one another. And what we, what we, want, to, we want to be aware of is that the universe continues to expand. Apparently, we're just at a point where we can uh, recognize how rapid that expansion is taking place. And these are the type of people who are thinking about this. These are people who are working in religion and science in the conversation. Brian Swim and Mary Evelyn Tucker. And one of the things that they are saying, here's a very simple book. You can look at their book, Journey of the Universe. The deep truth about matter, which neither Descartes nor Newton realized, is that over the course of four billion years, molten rocks, this is the Earth, transformed themselves into monarch butterflies, blue herons, and the exalted music of Mozart but it all begins with atomic consciousness. Everything is connected. It's holistic. And that's going to change our understanding of religion. Why? Because the great religious traditions and all religious texts are written when you had uh, the idea of a geocentric universe, that the human is the center. Now we know we're not the center of anything. The next thing and you have all of these wonderful relatives of ours. I mean, that, isn't it wonderful that we have a relative? That's a, Brian Swim will say, that's where you got your eyes. But that creature would look at us and say, boy, you look ugly. If you want, if you want some style, how about, how about the way I am? So what we have to do is learn to see, like the second chapter of Genesis says, if you look at Genesis 2, everything comes out of the earth. We are only as healthy as the soil, because we're made out of the soil. The soil is unhealthy. We can't be healthy. That's us. That's us with my hairdo. That's a cell. That's DNA. And what we see is that there is a, the, the great question of the Eastern traditions is, how do you align the internal cosmos, this universe that is in our consciousness, with the external cosmos? And that's what religious tradition is. That's what observing festivals in religious traditions do. Now we come to how our minds have to be transformed. And I shouldn't be even talking about this. But this is a person that I learned to have affection for at a distance. I have a friend, Irene Noel, who teaches scripture at a Benedictine uh, university in Atchison, Kansas. She's a, uh, a Benedictine nun. Langari Mathai came to Atchison, Kansas to do her undergraduate work. And uh, Langari Mathai uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 for getting nine million trees uh, planted in Kenya and Africa. And she is the embodiment of ecofeminism. You can read her obituary in the New York Times. Uh, she died at the age of 71, and she is dazzling. But that's what feminine consciousness does. And that's what it's like. And it, it, it has uh, the face of women of the South as well as of the North. 
This is a wonderful story. Um, I sat with Adele Reinhartz, who's a great biblical scholar who taught at the University of Ottawa and uh, has strong connections to Israel. Her daughter was apparently one of these people, woman who was ordained an Orthodox rabbi in Israel four years ago. Uh, this is the, from the Times of Israel. Here's a few of the people that were ordained. But that's feminism uh, entering into the great tradition of um, Jewish Orthodoxy, Orthodox Judaism in Israel. There is a Lutheran pastor in, or a Lutheran bishop in uh, Sweden. This is what's happening at universities, which is at the University of Virginia. There's the Center for Contemplative Sciences. What they do is they invite students to come and learn how to practice meditation and mindfulness and then contemplate how to transform the world. This is taken up in business. In, uh, you can look up Wisdom 2.0. Christy and I attended one of these conferences. It's uh, put on by people who, who were uh, connected with Google. They were uh, learning how to help people who were burning out writing code. And uh, one man who is an engineer from Stanford, he said, they call me the jolly good fellow because I was invited in Google to go around and sit with people in their office and introduce them to themselves, to explore silence and to become a person. And so we have this question about practice of listening, of being at home in our own being. And with the Tibetan Buddhist group that I attended, we. Uh, there was a, 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 and I still am connected with the community after 20 years. We'd uh, sit in the basement of a side-by-side -side duplex in uh, Marlboro with leaky pipes. And a very wonderful uh, monk who was taught in Tibet, he passed away a number of years ago. One of the holiest people I ever knew. He had nothing. But he... He would teach us, when you do your practice, here's how you can tell if it is complete, your practice being prayer. If you leave with compassion for all sentient beings, then you know. And that's the standard of religious practice. That's the standard. In Bhutan, you have these elegant people who say, we're trying to run our country according to the gross happiness product rather than the gross national product. Aren't they elegant people? But that comes from the traditions of the East. And then we could go on. We can talk about the, uh, the environmental movement is going to change all of us. And that's one of the people that's changing us. Are you familiar with uh, Greta Thunberg? Please look her up. She's 14 years old. Maybe she's 16 now. She's a student who went on strike in Sweden. Uh, notice, school strike. That's all I know about the Nordic languages. But it's for climate. She has the genius that derives from being on the autism spectrum. She's very plain spoken. So she's spoken uh, to uh, European uh, leadership saying, why aren't you upset? Don't you understand that you're killing all of us? And so what people like her have produced is this. Somebody from Canada, I don't know Calgary. And this, that's the woman I was talking about. We can make a call to Canadians that we, namely First Nations people, are their last and best hope for saving this planet. So think about feminism, ecology, because that is going to change us all. That's going to change us all. Not a question of what, of what, what policy we should have right now. It's consciousness, and young people have the consciousness. And then the last point I'll just leave you with is uh, refugees. We need refugees to make us whole, to teach us how to understand, 
to get us out of our boxes. And that's where that mindfulness practice of having compassion for all sentient beings leads to social action that will transform our churches uh, and it will transform the world. But that's the kind of the standard for, under, for, ask, for answering the question, how are we doing in our faith communities? Thanks very much. Thanks, Sean. Wow. Dazzling. Michael, not only did we have a really wonderful exploration of Christianity historically, but you brought it into uh, today's consciousness in a, in a very provocative way and, and very profound way. And I, I want to thank you for that and for uh, guiding us this year. It's been a, a wonderful journey. The uh, the questions uh, I saw about five high holiday sermons here. <laughs> it's amazing what uh, what what uh, what you did in terms of that point that you made about shared experiences unite us, and these are the things that all of us are thinking about in our respective traditions. Now we're being challenged with those, and I think dialogue and this kind of outreach to each other will allow us to not only unite, but hopefully to come to some uh, consensus about how we solve some of these very difficult problems. So I want to thank you uh, so much and thank all of you for participating this year. The, um, the, the, the Lil Fader Interfaith Scholar in Residence Program, I think has sort of come to its um, appropriate conclusion. We've done six years. And we're going to be looking for other ways to continue the study and the exploration of uh, different traditions and religious literacy, but probably not with the same kind of focus that we've, we've done uh, for the past six years. It's been quite an exploration. If you think about it, we started with the, uh, the Sikh tradition, then we explored um, uh, indigenous spirituality, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Christianity. It's quite a journey, and um, I'm, I'm hoping over the summer to actually try to synthesize some of the experiences that we've had and, and uh, put those out for people to um, continue to think about how we go forward. But uh, this has made a, a tremendous impact uh, personally on me in terms of how I, how I engage people outside of this community, this congregation, and how we should interface with other people in terms of dialogue. Um, fortunately, the people that um, most of us have contact with are not the ones who have these uh, dogmatic fixed views in which dialogue really isn't possible, uh, but just a, an affirmation that we are who we are and you are who you are and we respect that. But really, the opportunity that we've had by reaching out to other communities through this six year period has, has been very uh, illuminating, very uh, profoundly uh, life changing in terms of how we see people and interact with people. Um, it's, it's one thing studying and hearing a lecture, it's another thing taking all of that into one's relationship with other people and being, being able to have the uh, capacity to ask questions uh, that are more knowledgeable and sensitive and, and uh, uh, thought-provoking. So I want to thank you for uh, doing that this year for us. And uh, thank you all for engaging in this, uh, this project. It's been, a, I think, a, a very innovative, creative, and uh, uh, life-changing uh, endeavor. So we'll continue in different ways. If you have some thoughts and some ideas about what you'd like to see us uh, move toward, please, uh, please let me know, and we'll continue to do that. So thank you. I hope it's uh, stopped raining, and uh, <laughs> we can go out and enjoy the rest of the day. So uh, again, thank you. Thank you.